Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk About It. This is Susan Johnson, and I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Dennis O'Brien, and we have another great show for you this evening, something to do with the topics that are going on right at the Capitol right now and something that's going on all over the state of Connecticut. We have Marie Painter, and she is the state long-term care on Booth's person uh, for the Department of Aging and Disability Services. We are thrilled to have her here, and so I want to welcome you to the show, Marie. Hello, thank you. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, I, I know that we've, I was uh, talking uh, today to the uh, Aging Committee uh, Chair, Jane Garraby, uh, Housing Chair, and we had a meeting about some of the issues that you deal with on a regular basis. So I'm really interested in being able to talk to you, but let's first of all start off by saying a little bit about what a long-term care on Booth's person does for Department of Aging and Disability Services. Well, thank you, and thank you so much for having me on today and for highlighting the work that we do. Uh, the Long-Term Care Ombudsperson Program, which is new for us, we were the Ombudsman, we are recently the Ombudsperson Program. Um, we are administratively housed at the Department of Aging and Disability Services in the state of Connecticut, and our role is to represent the rights of residents in nursing homes, residential care homes and assisted living or managed residential communities. And just as of last session, um, we now have our program that will be growing to also support individuals living at home on home care. So that is that is very good information and uh, that is something that we will be dealing with because I guess what happened is uh, over the last say 20 years or so, we've had a situation where uh, we've had money follows the person and it's gotten to the point now where services from your agency are really needed to make sure that people who have uh, issues that ordinarily would be treated in a nursing facility would actually be treated at home because of money follows the person. Yes, so money follows the person um, grew out of federal regulations that require that individuals have the choice to choose to receive their long-term services and supports in the least restrictive environment. And we really saw once that program began in the state of Connecticut and over about a 10 year period, that we were able to see the growth almost go from more individual, was more individuals receiving their long-term services and supports in a skilled nursing facility to now more of the individuals on um, services are receiving them in the community um, or in a less restrictive environment. Yeah, and I think that that kind of grew out of uh, something that I'll go back to based on my um, um, information, uh, which is the uh, the change in how home care services were covered under the Medicare program in the 90s. And they changed that and capitated the payment systems, which really limited the amount of home care services uh, that were available to people in the community with a Medicare payment. So that's just kind of a, a thing that I think happened. And then from there we went to, uh, well, we should probably do money follows the person so that the people can go with a uh, the same amount of money that, say, would be paid in a nursing facility uh, would help care for them in the home under the Medicaid program. Yes, I think there were, there were a lot of factors. There was also a federal decision. It's called the Olmstead decision that requires um, community integration for everyone and I, I, there were we got to a point in our greater community where people wanted to ensure that no matter what your payer source was that you have options as to where you receive your care and that it's quality care yes that's great yeah i um yeah that's very good uh good a good also uh, uh way to analyze what we're doing and uh of course, we still need nursing facilities, and we'll get to that topic in a couple minutes. But uh, first, Dennis has some questions. Well, I, I okay. Hi, hi, Mary. How you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Uh, well, I'm pretty good as long as my mic's working right. Uh, I'm going to change my location here. Uh, I'm doing well. I I don't know if Susan told you, but I was a judge of probate for 12 years and served in the Wyndham uh, Probate Court, Wyndham and uh, Scotland, uh, until uh, 2011 when I uh, aged out, so to speak. But uh, 
I recall the, uh, talking about what Susan's been talking about, which is uh, a little bit complicated, but uh, I recall during the latter parts of my tenure there, uh, the law changed quite a bit, and uh, the probate judges were given the authority to uh, order uh, people uh, released from a uh, nursing home into the community. That didn't happen much in my experience, but uh, uh, that that was something that was very new back around 2008 or so, as, as I recall it. And I, but I did spend a lot of time um, going to nursing homes. We have three here in Wyndham, and um, I did do a lot of work with uh, seniors who needed uh, care in, in, in either a skilled nursing facility or, uh, for the most part, or, or home care. Uh, and there, there, there are some um, assisted living places in the area, but not too many. I can think of one in Brooklyn called Creamery Brook. But anyway, I do have experience with uh, these kinds of issues, and I'm really, really happy to uh, get to meet you on the show. Um, I, the questions I have are pretty basic to start. Uh, so your office is, is, is new, is that right? No, actually, our office has been around um, for many years, um, over over 30 years, but we were moved uh, due to something called the final rule federally. We used to be housed at Department of Social Services, and then the program moved to the Department on Aging. Um, and then at that point, uh, we, we moved again when Department of Aging um, was, that, pro that department was sunsetted. And so we've kind of moved around a bit, but the new regulation says that we cannot sit inside of a state agency where they either pay or have oversight in any way of skilled nursing facilities or any of the settings where we have oversight because we work at the direction of residents. And my te myself and my team members are not mandated reporters. We um, work on behalf of residents and in their dire by their direction. So. That can be challenging at times, um, especially for family members if they call in a complaint or a friend and they want us to address it. We go and we ask the resident themselves if they want us to address it and we take their direction. Um, and having us administratively housed really supports that autonomy and our ability to advocate for things that residents and family members want us to advocate for, um, not just taking direction from the state agency. Well, it's, I, I, I can see where that might be considered a conflict of interest to have you housed in the Department of Social Services. And I, even though, you know, a lot of times uh, conflicts are just uh, apparent, but they're not real. But, you know, if people perceive that, that your agency is in conflict with um, your clients, uh, that's, not, that's not good for your credibility and it's not good for your effectiveness. So that's a... That's a good move, as far as I can tell. Um, how many, uh, you must have a staff. Can you tell us what, uh, how many people you have working with you? Yes, I have an incredible team that works um, in partnership with me, and they are regional ombudsmen, and I have eight regional ombudsmen. Um, and they have an incredible amount of work. I have two intake coordinators who take all of the calls all around the state for any issues or concerns, so if you call us, um, you will get either Stephanie or Deb. And then my administrative assistant, Susan, who keeps us all on track and going. And what is the, what is the phone number? The phone number is 1-866-388-1888. Oh, that should be easy to remember for, for some people, maybe not for me. But, but in any event, that's... Uh, that's really interesting, and I'll bet you, uh, your office, how long have you been with the office? So I accepted this position in May of 2018. Um, I previously was a regional ombudsman for seven years. Um, five years prior, I went to DSS for about five years and then came back as the state ombudsman. Would you mind telling me what region you were in? I was in the Waterbury region. Uh -huh. um, as the regional ombudsman, and then when I was at DSS, I was kind of all over. So I, I have worked in the Willimantic, the greater Willimantic um, area at times, and at one point in my life, I worked at DCS in Willimantic, so I'm very familiar with the area. 
When did you work at DCF in Willimantic? That's kind of a personal question because I was the uh, I was the administrative judge at the Children's Court uh, during my 12 years there. Oh, okay. I was there in I started there in 2004. Okay, well, I was uh, <laughs> I was there in you 2004. You may have been one of my judges. Yeah, you maybe have come to my court and didn't know it. I don't know. Did you go to court much at all? Yes. <laughs> yep. Children's court or uh, DCF? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that topic because we're not here to talk about that. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kind of curious, but uh, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, you you must have been, or your office must have been, your staff, you must have been incredibly busy during the, uh, you know, the height of the COVID problem when we didn't have the vaccine. I'm sure you were. In the pandemic, we, um, we just had an incredible number of complaints and concerns, mainly because family members could not get in and friends to support residents living in skilled nursing facilities. And staff in long-term care facilities provide incredible amounts of care. However, I think, I don't think anyone really understood the amount of support that comes from family and friends. It helps to support the work that's being done by paid staff. And sometimes that's just having someone sit and talk with them, help them um, with anxiety or other uh, fears that they may have, or just that, that visit that helps to calm them. Um, and at a period of time where people were, we were all so incredibly anxious and stressed about what was happening, residents were, were really forced to stay in their rooms alone and for long, long periods of time. And that has had a lot of trauma and um, impact to those individuals. I'm sure, and uh, the job that you're doing and the responsibility that you have, to my way of thinking, having been a probate judge and having dealt with so many conservatorships in my uh, 12 years in the probate court and so many people in need of, of care, uh, I, I understand exactly how how busy you must be and how important your uh, your, your work is to the, to the people of our state, not only to the uh, residents, uh, to the people uh, that are directly affected, but also, as you say, to their families. And, um, you know, a lot of them are, I'm sure, serving as, con a lot of people in uh, skilled nursing facilities do have conservators. I, I'm fully aware yeah. of that. And, and you would have to, you would be dealing with conservators as well. I'm gonna, oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to let Susan ask a few questions, but I could go on all, all, all. Wait, Either one of us could go on all the time. Uh, so, But sure. we so appreciate having you here. And I, um, I have a background as an advocate for Medicare beneficiaries for approximately 20 years, representing people in nursing facilities, getting their Medicare coverage and, or the Medicaid issues, or representing people uh, who were uh, disabled in Social Security disability cases. So I have uh, experience experience in that area as well. So this is an area where we're going to just have to have you back to talk some more. <laughs> but anyway, just following up on where Dennis was and, and the uh, the amazing uh, proposals that have been proposed by uh, President Biden on the summary of the Biden-Harris administration nursing home reforms, we could just follow up on, on some of the things that uh, that we found out during the pandemic, like the continued testing uh, for uh, long-term care facilities for people who uh, might have COVID-19, uh, the vaccination and boosters. And of course, we're running uh, out of the emergency period of time and how that transition will look to you for some of these things that uh, were made uh, these, these protocols that were put in place to address COVID-19 and also some of the things that you talk about like when you have when you're in a nursing facility uh, people uh, who are isolated and may have some memory or difficulty with some maybe minor dementia could have uh, maybe full-blown dementia after spending time alone which really creates another problem for uh, the nursing home and the staffing requirements that one might have as well as the, uh, and I'll just, I know you have the list, so I'll just go through the emergency preparedness and uh, how to integrate pandemic lessons into nursing home requirements, I guess is the overall question, so. That was a, there was a lot there, and that, um, you covered a lot of great points. One, I want to thank you for your work with uh, Medicare, and we partner wonderfully with the Center for Medicare Advocacy, and I'm so thankful for 
the work that anyone does um, in that area because it is incredibly important and sometimes people first touch into long-term care. Um, and when you're talking about what we've learned from the pandemic and where we can go from what we learned and ensuring that there's so many times in our history where we have to respond to things quickly. And when we are able to reflect on how we responded, we see that there are opportunities and there's potential to do things differently that may have had outcomes that would have benefited the people that we were trying to serve. We just didn't know. But when you know better, you should be able to do better. And so I'm really thankful that the White House is taking this opportunity to reflect on these things and to move um, sort of that needle forward. And as they're starting to, again, sunset the, some of the, um, I would say, overarching pandemic um, focuses and moving in another direction, I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of those. Um, one of the things that was put in place is called the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition, and that came out of um, work that the White House was doing, and it really is out of the National Academics of Science, Engineering, and Medicine um, report. And so there are now two, going to be six, uh, seven committees that over the next two years work alongside um, experts, nursing home residents, um, members of, I would say, academia, uh, professionals that have been um, in the field firsthand living this, and coming up with recommendations regarding um, how to improve quality of life and overall care in our long-term care settings. So taking what we learned during that period of time, kind of processing it and talking about it, and then coming up with real um, steps to, like the name of the group, move forward and see better outcomes. Well, that's, that's, that's a wonderful answer, and I appreciate your taking on the probably protracted question that I made. But, but nevertheless, I think that there's a couple of things that I wanted to drill down into with respect sure. to that, which is why I suggested an overall answer and then drill down into the different levels of care uh, that, that are now in place because of the uh, changes that we made with Money Follows the Person, where you have a supposedly similar level of care in your house that you would have in a skilled nursing facility. So why don't we take a look at that for a second. Sure. Well, so you're talking about if someone's plan of care, they're in a nursing home, and then they transition home? Yes. Yep. Okay. So someone would have something called a universal assessment, and that is when um, a specialized case manager would come to the long-term care community, come to the nursing home, and they would do an assessment of the individual. And every resident has the right to request one of these assessments, and I strongly encourage everyone to do it. It is, there's no fee for it. And even if you're assessed and they come up with a plan, you can say no thank you, but you won't know unless you get the assessment what they're able to offer. And, and know, many times, pardon me? I, I was just going to say that's an excellent point because a lot of the times when I did the, when I read records, a lot of the time a person wouldn't have the assessment in the home before they went home, and this is before money follows the person. But I think it was really important to have the home looked at to see what possibilities for uh, a trip and fall or some other problem uh, existed in the home, or maybe there had to be an adjustment made for a wheelchair. Those are the kinds of things that uh, you would hope that would be addressed before somebody made the transition from a nursing facility to the home. Yes, and, and they can do that. So the first assessment would be to determine what the person, what the individual's hands-on care needs would be or queuing needs if they had a memory care diagnosis and more of their needs were related to queuing. And then depending on um, their age or their needs would determine what services they were eligible for, maybe a waiver, um, maybe they opted for community first choice where they are self-directing. Um, if they need someone to provide them with hands-on care, they have a physical disability where they're not able to do something physically, but they can um, direct someone else in doing that. So once that's determined, you're right. Once they go into the home, either they help them secure housing through a WRAP rental assistance program, which that sometimes is an option, or if they have a home they're returning to, they can do a visit to that home and see if modifications need to be done. 
to your point, maybe it's removing rugs, moving furniture to ensure that the house is accessible in that way. Maybe they need a ramp installed. Or it could be something more in-depth like um, moving some things around in the bathroom and making it so someone can wheel in. Or if it's in the house and the only bathroom is upstairs, do they need a stair glide? So those assessments can be made, and depending on the type of waiver or services someone's going out under, um, that can sometimes be included in the plan. That's great information. And so the other thing would be uh, when you have money follows the person, someone, so I have constituents who maybe they were in nursing facilities for almost 10 years mm -hmm. and were wheelchair bound. And yet they were able to to be placed in a, in a, in a in an apartment uh, for senior citizens, and uh, they're getting the care and the treatment that they uh, that they're happy where they are. Uh, so they're getting it through the home care agency. But I, I think the question that I have now with a housing shortage, I my guess is that it might be more difficult uh, now to place somebody make that transition from the nursing facility uh, to uh, uh, an apartment, say, for uh, for seniors or for people with disabilities uh, than it was even a couple of years ago before COVID. Yes, housing is absolutely a challenge. Um, and there are opportunities out there and we, we look for them and we have housing coordinators that work extremely hard to make those connections with landlords. We're also working on um, developing other types of housing. So right now we're working with the residential care homes. Um, one of our goals here in Connecticut is that the residential care homes meet something called the home and community based settings rules so that individuals can receive waiver services in those settings because not everyone wants to live alone, right? So I think when I think about my future, I'm not used to living alone and I might want an environment that is a house where several people live and maybe we share some common areas, but I also have um, my own private room and control over that. Whereas um, some of our residential care homes, there's one in the Waterbury area that is an old hotel where people um, each have their own room and bathroom, like a hotel room, and then they share a common space to eat. And so moving forward, we are trying to think um, at the state level in a different way, also at the federal level, and how do you assess what people want. Um, do they want to live alone in their own home? How do we ensure that once they're in the hospital and going to a nursing home, that we can provide them with all the information to stabilize that housing so that we're not looking for housing for them again and giving them that information up front. Um, the Department of Social Services has a new program called My Care Options. And that's something that the options counselor can go in and meet with individuals about once they get into um, a skilled nursing facility so that it stabilizes their housing and they're able um, to get back there if at all possible. And then if that's not an option or something they want to do and they want to look at an apartment, they want to look at maybe shared housing or adult family living or even a residential care home, what does that look like for them? and ensuring that it's about their best day and how they want to see um, their goals met moving forward. Well, I hadn't even thought of the idea of sharing uh, like a house, you know, with or like a hotel or maybe a large, large home uh, where you'd have uh, people with their own bedroom and bathroom, uh, but yet, you know, almost like a boarding house, uh, uh, you know. So and the other thing about that, it sounds good to me, is that when you have people who have uh, similar needs in a, in a, in a close, closer area, uh, it saves the uh, the, the need for the home care services because uh, the people have to travel around and if you have a large group of people with similar needs in the same place, then you could have the nurse or the physical therapist or the uh, homemaker health aide come to, those, to that one place and provide service to many people at once. Yes, and that will have to do with choice and people get choice as to what services they have, but often because of that um, consistency, we do see people choosing to use agencies that have several people in one location. We also hear that it reduces the risk of isolation, that people enjoy knowing that, yes, I have my privacy, but when I want to be social, when I want to have people around, they're there. 
and some people prefer that socialization to come from people visiting their home where others prefer to live in a setting. If you've always lived in an apartment and had people around or had close neighbors, being away from that can be very isolating. And we know that isolation for individuals can have significant impact to their health as well. Absolutely. Well, we're going to break uh, for our sponsors, and we will be right back after these uh, messages. Uh, we have uh, Miriam Painter, who is the uh, long-term care ombudsman here on the show, and we thank you so much, and we'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Uh, think about maybe uh, people who, uh, you know, are at the time – at a situation where perhaps the nursing facility thinks that maybe they are ready to go home or find, you know, go into um, another living type of situation, and um, and maybe the person is concerned about making that transition. What happens in those kinds of circumstances, and is this kind of a pressure from the nursing facility based on the Medicaid reimbursement? That is an excellent question, and there are new protections. Um, built in because that does come up. So any facility-initiated discharge, so that's when the facility says, we think you're ready to go and we want to discharge you. A resident always has the right to say no thank you. Um, they have the right to reach out to our office and the facility is required to give them a 30-day notice and to send that in on the same day to my office. Um, when we receive those, we reach out to the resident to see if they'd like to appeal that and if they would like our assistance moving forward related to that involuntary discharge because we work to ensure that it's safe and appropriate and that it's what the resident is directing um, as far as their goals. Excellent, excellent. Dennis, you have a question. Yeah, I, I was wondering, uh, May Reed, if you could tell us, and this may be a tough question, uh, because you, you're, the work you do, I'm sure, is so varied given the, uh, all the different situations that might arise in an SNF or assisted living, but could you, could you tell us what, uh, what type of situation uh, you encounter the most in terms of uh, requests from, um, let's say, SNF residents? I would say the thing we hear about the most is not being able to receive appropriate care and services, so staffing issues. Um, since the pandemic, prior to the pandemic, the last meeting I had with the Department of Social Services and Department of Public Health was about staffing issues. So this is not a new issue. Um, we are overbedded here in Connecticut. We have too many nursing home beds as people are choosing other options. Um, and so buildings not being at full census, although the census is higher than it was during COVID, but not being at full census, um, draws down the amount of money a facility has. And so we see that impacting staffing. We have um, bills pending this session related to that. But what happens is individuals can't get the individualized care that they need, getting up, dressed, showered, um, oral health care. Those are the complaints that we're getting right now. However, we're really seeing that part of the industry is recovering and some of the homes are doing well and they're starting to recover. And although they're not back to being back to where they would like and um, maybe not back to where they were pre-pandemic. Um, they are they're gaining. We're seeing those residents starting to um, recover as well and rebound to where they were and getting those needs met where we have other facilities where we have um, very significant concerns and staffing issues that we're not seeing recover and those um, residents are experiencing this every day. One follow-up question, and I'll, I'll let Susan get back involved in questioning you. We're both very anxious to ask you questions. You're giving such great responses. And, 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 and that question is, uh, okay, so if somebody, uh, say, uh, raises a, an issue to, to your agency or makes a claim or a complaint or whatever you want to call it, uh, similar to what you uh, described, what is the, what, what are the steps you take? Is, uh, I would assume you're first step is to contact the nursing home and uh, see if you can resolve the, the, uh, the matter that way. Uh, but uh, let, me, uh, let me just go, go on to a next step and say, what if, it, what if you can't resolve it at that level? Is there an administrative process that you can follow? So actually we don't contact the nursing home. The first thing we do is we talk to the residents. So 
Um, they have absolute, absolute, absolute confidentiality with us. So if a complaint is called in, the regional ombudsman goes and makes a visit to the residents, talks to them about their complaint, gives them some suggestions about how that complaint can be resolved, and asks them what do they want to see happen? How do they want it addressed? And we'll, we'll go over different options with them. And then my team members have to have, because we're confidential and we're not mandated reporters, they have to have the express permission of the residents to address it with the nursing home. Sorry, I, so skipped that. Sorry I skipped that, 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 that step. I should have known better. That's what I would do as a lawyer. So, you're, you know, I, I just assumed that you would do that. But uh, you're, you're, you're being very explicit, and I appreciate that. But if they give us permission, then yes. Our first step would be to try to negotiate um, an outcome where the individual needs are met and it's a satisfactory outcome for the residents. Um, and we work with the facility, we may um, help address concerns. If at that point um, there's still no resolution and the resident wants it taken to another step, we can do a few things. Depending on the type of complaint, um, we work with the individual so that they can file a complaint with the Department of Public Health. Um, there's a portal to do that where people can go in. Um, I say be as descriptive as possible, have times, dates, names, exactly what happened. Um, so that DPH can address those concerns. If an individual can't do that on their own, um, then we would assist in doing that for them. Um, sometimes family members now have photos. They can have cameras in nursing homes. So we're starting to get footage from, um, you know, vid video and footage from um, cameras as well. And so getting that over to the Department of Public Health and looking for an investigation in that way would be a next step. That is uh, that is very very interesting, and that is really a complete answer. And that uh, I, I you know that's something I I certainly did not know. Just like most of the answers you're giving to uh, certainly to Susan and also to me, and I really appreciate that. That's uh, that's very very good. And I I, I would think that with um, with that kind with those kinds of options for your office or your and your staff and your regional ombudsman, um, you would need probably two or three times the staff you have to. <laughs> to deal with all of this, I would think so, but I don't know. It all depends, on, of course, on, on the volume of, of, you know, complaints or concerns. Well, I, I just we have wanna... about go ahead. Oh, so we have about um, a little, almost forty three hundred complaints a year. So yes, my team definitely um, we we could easily use double the size of the team and have plenty of complaints for people to address and um, try to resolve. Excellent. Yeah, and I, I know that we're aware of some of that, some, and I know we're going to be hearing uh, that in the aging committee. Uh, but you had mentioned that uh, this, uh, there's a couple of questions that I have, and that is the you mentioned that there that the nursing facilities are overbedded, but I don't think that the numbers of beds uh, that we have are actually the numbers of staff people to address the people in the beds are, are matching up right now. That is correct. Um, and it, but again, it depends on the nursing home. Some nursing homes continue to admit even when they don't have the staff. So that's another bill that we have pending this year. Um, we feel very strongly that nursing homes should not be accepting new residents if they do not have the appropriate number of staff to care for the residents who they've already committed to and are living in that skilled nursing facility. Um, because, you know, when someone is a new resident, they also have a lot of needs. They need to be assisted with the adjustment. Um, there's a lot of information to go over, and it takes a lot of the staff's time to do that appropriately. And we want to make sure for that individual that they have the care and attention that they need, as well as for the other individuals that are already there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, then <clears throat> following up on, <clears throat> on that thought pattern, um, the other facilities, when you were talking about some facilities are uh, functioning better and maybe have more staff than others, I'm wondering, uh, one of the things that I've noticed, whether it's in education or healthcare, when the organization that owns the facility or provides the, you know, uh, pretty much owns that particular business uh, is out of state versus in-state operational owners, uh, do you see a difference in the way that the care is provided and the staffing measures that are taken? 
That's an interesting, well, that's an interesting question for me because historically I would have told you yes. If it was five years ago, I would have told you yes. Today I will tell you no. Um, what makes the biggest difference is when you have a company that provides respect for the staff that live there, treats them in a dignified manner, has appropriate health care for them, and pays them a livable wage. When all of those things are in place, we see staff returning. Um, they need to be able to have days off, time with their family, respect for their appointments and their needs. And when staff are overworked and when they feel so burdened, because staff show up because they care about the residents, right? And so right. when something goes wrong, it often falls on the direct care staff that are trying their best. They need to be the only person there and making a choice between two really challenging or um, bad decisions. But when something goes wrong, it's often that direct care staff that gets left holding the responsibility when maybe they weren't given enough team members. Maybe to ensure that there was someone there, they've worked the past 20 days in a row without a break or so many doubles. And that's when we see errors made, we see accidents happen, and we do see an increase in abuse because it is incredibly challenging work and these people keep showing up every day and we need to have a higher value and respect for them. Oh yeah, that's that's very, very, very that's a very good answer. And I was uh, I'm surprised by the answer as well because uh, I my my thoughts were that maybe we we're having a hard time regulating uh, the owners that are out of state. But I'm glad to hear that it's they're focusing more on now uh, what kind of uh, services the people, the providers are, are getting and how they're supported by the owners of the facilities, which is really a very important thing. And I think it goes a long way to making sure tra the patients are treated fairly. And then the other thing, and this might be a little bit outside the scope, so tell me if I'm going too far, but um, I noticed that there are... Uh, hospital discharge planning uh, situations where uh, the, the person is not um, really well enough to go into, a say, a rest home, which is a level of care uh, and long-term care, but they're, all, they're, not, they're not being accepted into nursing facilities either. And I wondered, since I'm just wondering if that's an issue that you've noticed. Yes. So the question of level of care comes up quite often, right? You have to be at a skilled nursing level of care. And what does that mean? You need assistance with bathing, dressing, toileting, feeding, or transferring. And if not, some people are in that in-between. And so that's where we would look at that level of assisted living or residential care homes. Um, and then if people are, oh, sorry, we have a very tight little dog in the house, a big dog. Um, people at a higher level of care, we're seeing much higher acuity in skilled nursing homes than we have seen historically. Or as we store here. Um, so historically, we had lower levels of care in skilled nursing facilities, and now we're seeing this high level of care, high level of need um, related to the individuals living there and needing that support. So that does come up a lot. You know, I remember back in the day when the hospitals first put in the diagnostic related groupings capitated system in the 80s. And we used to say they're being discharged sicker and quicker. Is it even more so than that? <laughs> I mean, that's uh, that was back in the day. So, um, so it sounds like it's even more so today. Yes, they are being discharged incredibly quickly. But we're working with hospital discharge planners as well to ensure that the resident that shows up at the nursing home represents the resident that was on paper, right? Because we don't want anyone coming through the door and arriving in a skilled nursing facility and not representing who they thought they were accepting because that's not only challenging for the nursing home, but it's challenging for the individual. Can you imagine going somewhere and it doesn't feel like they're happy to see you or with all the other complicated issues you have going on when you're dealing with an illness and, and going to a place to get care and then you get there and you're like, oh, no, we can't take care of you. It's, it's very upsetting for that individual and um, the impact is incredible. 
Yes, it is. And of course, the, the hospitals are going to be penalized now because they did change the rules. So if they do discharge somebody too soon, then that will show up in their, in their audits if the person has to go back to the hospital again for the same condition. Correct. Yep. And watching for that and ensuring that, that that communication and that discharge go well, yes. How does, the, how does that whole system, when we go back to money follows the person, or uh, or we go into a situation where they're going into a personal care assistance situation, uh, how does how does that uh, work with the home care agencies? Do we have enough uh, home care services uh, throughout the state to address the people who would need, say, some type of home care, whether it's paid by Medicare or Medicaid? I think we could always need more home care. Um, this actually came up in a public hearing yesterday related to home care, um, home, home and companion. You know, there's a lot of different types of services yep. now. So yep. having the ability for individuals to choose the type of care and services they want, um, PCAs, personal care attendants, versus a home health aide, versus a nurse. Um, and that's where those assessments are key in getting that assessment done understanding what an individual's goals are, and then looking at do they need or want agency-based care, or do they want to self-direct? And through Community First Choice, which is something that Connecticut has under their state plan amendment, that allows people to hire family members, friends, um, anyone who's not legally liable for that individual uh -huh. can be hired, and that individual can direct the care and services um, in that way. So that does help out and sort of take some of the burden off the um, more professional um, part of the industry. May Reed Painter, this has been a wonderful interview and I hope that we can have you back uh, soon because we've just skimmed across the top, haven't we? And we're running yeah. down to the last 30 seconds. So it's gone fast <laughs> and I can't thank you enough for being here and let's talk about it. So thank, thank you so you much. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Thank you very much, Mary Reed. I, I wish we had another hour to talk. I've got so many questions in my brain that I want to ask, but I'm going to I'm going to wait till we have you again, and I hope that uh, that'll be soon. So you take care Anytime. and keep warm, and uh, we'll hopefully we'll see you soon. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Yeah. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. That's let's talk about it for today. We'll be back next week with another great show.